So to my right, to your left. And um, we have some fantastic stalls, as you would have seen when you came in. But the stalls are not just in here or in the foyer. There's another room at the, the back. So please do go and visit all the stalls during the course of the, the day. Um, I want to pay tribute to uh, Colette. I don't know if she's in the room or she's wandering around. But Colette is central. in this event and I know it's come with its challenges and it made me think about the um, PAC 45 conference and what challenges they may have uh, uh, faced at that time. And um, the 5th Pan-African Congress was held from 15th to the 21st of October. So, you know, we've, we've held this conference to coincide with those dates. And decisions at the conference led to the liberation of African countries Participants included Kwame Nkrumah, Jomo Kenyatta, and um, a fellow Trinidadian, George Padmore. And um, I had the honor of um, performing at a blue plaque unveiling for George Padmore um, about three or four years ago. And I'm going to share later on in the day, if time permits, the, the poem that I performed in tribute to George Padmore, because he played an important role as one of the co-organizers of the, the Fifth Pan-African Congress. There were uh, 90 or so delegates, scholars, political activists from the UK, from uh, the continent of Africa, and from the Caribbean. It's considered to be, it was considered to be one of the most important Pan-African Congresses. It advanced Pan-Africanism and um, challenged colonialism and involved people from the African diaspora but also people from the African diaspora based in Manchester. So I think that it's really fitting that um, this conference commemorating the 70th anniversary has also been organized by African activists here in um, Manchester. And the, the fifth Pan-African Congress made African history, and of course that means it made world history because African history is world history. And I hope, you know, with this event here today, we can also um, make history with the decisions we make um, and uh, the workshops and the speakers that we hear from. And I want us to conduct this day in um, uh, you know, the spirit of African unity in a comradely, sisterly, brotherly fashion where we respect each other and um, respect what each other has to say. Um, I'm now going to move on to, before our panel of speakers, who I'll introduce uh, one by one sitting with me here at the table, um, a, a speaker who is Chief Mrs. Eloise Edwards, MBEMA, who's going to share with us a few words before the next session. Thank you.
said, good morning, Africans. Good morning. Good Greetings. I am I'm overwhelmed. I must thank Colette for arranging this meeting so that we could meet as Africans. But I must say that there are things about us that I must mention. Things that hurt me. And I want you to know, I want you to understand, I am 82 years of age. I came to this country 1960. And during that period, I've worked along with others, many others, to try and promote Africa. I don't understand why is it that some of us find it so difficult to embrace Africa. We are the first people on this earth, but we are the last to recognize it. I would have thought that over the years of us planning and preparing <coughs> conferences and meetings like this, that today I would have seen us come as Africans, visually. I am so disappointed, not only in this group, but I attend so many African conferences and so many African things, and we deny ourselves. We are prepared to be Americans, Canadians, Europeans, but we are afraid of being ourselves. And this, this is my message, you know. I remember last year, I think it was, that um, Marcus Garvey's son came over here. And I was invited to meet with him at the town hall, Manchester town hall. And as usual, I'm regaled in my African clothes. And I was expecting to see his entourage regaled. And he comes into the room, along with his other people, and they're dressed in suits. I was astonished. I really, really was, because I know that at the West Indian Center, a lot of young people were there waiting to greet these people and dressed in the colors of Africa. What is wrong with us? What is wrong? Why are we giving away our things to other people? We will not spend our money with ourselves, and that is why we are in the state that we are in. Being an African is not just coming to a conference. It's being here, in here. This is Africa. Not this, are they? they if you don't have it in your mind, then you could as well give up. And whilst I was at the meeting with the um, Garvey's song, I thought I must say how I feel about their appearance. And I said, you've come into Manchester. There will be lots of young people waiting to greet you. And they are dressed as Africans, and you come in here wearing the same clothes of the people who have tormented us. And you know what he said? He had a little badge, an African pin, and that is what he showed me. He said, but look, I've got the flag of Africa. And I burst into tears because I thought we have belittled ourselves. That is what you think of Africa. And if you are somebody who people respect, you have to show them respect. And I ask you, 
I'm 82, as I said, I'll be 83 in a couple of months. I don't know how much longer I've got on this earth, but I would have expected there are lots of people making African clothes, and for heaven's sake, once in a while, let us be Africans, not just talk. They talk a lot. But that's not good enough. What are we passing on to our children? It's, it hurts. It hurts. Because I expect, I expected this room to be glowing and flowing with our Africanness. I could as well have been at the town hall listening to other people. Oh, there'll be lots of speeches and talks about Africa. But who are we? What are we? So please, remember, there are lots of people before us who did a hell of a lot on our behalf. Let us show them the courtesy. So it's not every day. I mean, I'm not saying that you should not wear Africa, other people's clothes. But wherever the Englishman goes, or woman goes, or the American, they wear their things. And we wear theirs. So I think whenever we have these conferences, please state African clothes. We must support ourselves, or oh, we are doomed. In that respect, I, I, I don't have anything else. I'm, I'm sad, I'm very sad. And those of you who have taken the trouble, I'm a plain speaker, you know. I, 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 I do not apologize for what I say. I never do, because I know that I am speaking the truth. And I know that some of you, it will grip you here, you know. But please, once in a while, remember us. Remember our four parents and the struggles that they had. And don't only remember it, but share it. Thank you very much. www.pac45foundation.com All of those of you that are on um, Twitter Do they need to do that now? Do you want me to do they want well, to be no, now? Okay. Um, you, can, you can explain what this means. Um, and also, anybody on Twitter? Who's on Twitter in here? Okay, we need you to tweet. We need to get the message out. We need to get it trending that this is happening, that this is, a, you know, marking a historical, important event. And the uh, hashtag to use is um, hashtag PAC, P -A -C 70. So please tweet throughout the day when we can find it and retweet and get the message out about what's happening. Um, right, I've got a message from my sister Colette that says please put your hands up to get what does the wristband do? Uh, it just allows us to keep hold of your 
Okay, ma'am. Yeah. So. So. So administration is really good. So Sister well, Colette will go around then and give you give those of you who haven't got a wristband one. Okay, I'm, I'm going to introduce our um, speakers for the next session. We've got uh, an esteemed panel uh, sitting up here with me. We've got Pro Professor Hakeem Adi on my left, Cecil Gutsmore on my right, Sir Jeff Palmer on my far right. So I'm going to introduce each speaker as they come up. And in your program, hopefully you've all picked up one of the programs when you registered. And if you haven't, they are out there at the front at the registration desk. There is um, biographies of the speakers, so you can read that you know, at your leisure to see a bit more. But Professor Hakeem Adi is Professor of the History of Africa and the African Diaspora at the University of Chichester. The author of West Africans in Britain, 1900 to 60, Nationalism, Pan-Africanism and Communism. communism. 1945 Manchester Pan-African Congress revisited and many other, so I think he has some of them here and they're available for you to buy. And he's currently working on a history of Pan-Africanism. And if you look in your program, you can see his website, find out more, and I'm sure you'll have the opportunity to speak to all our speakers during the course of the day. By the way, we're not going to have the morning tea break because we've kind of uh, reached it. So what I'd say is, you know, if you need to um, uh, some refreshments, then please, you know, step out at your leisure, but please uh, try not to disrupt any speakers as you go out. And also, I did hear some mobile phones. Can you turn your mobile phones to silent? If you're able to switch them off, if not, if you could put them on uh, silent. And I'd like to welcome the uh, next speaker, Professor Hakeem Adi. Thank you very much. So, good morning, Manchester. Yeah. Okay, we can do better than that. This is the famous city which organized the most important of all the Pan African Congresses. So, good morning, Manchester. Okay, well, that's maybe slightly better. Maybe I know people were out clubbing last night. I'm a very softly spoken person, so I'll try to project. Okay, so for those people who didn't hear me in the back, I said good morning, Manchester. So anyway, it's my great pleasure to be here for the 70th anniversary of the famous Manchester Pan-African Congress. I was also here for the 60th anniversary of the famous Manchester Pan-African Congress. And I was here for the 50th anniversary of the famous Manchester Pan-African Congress. Somebody actually asked me this morning, was I here in 1945? <laughs> I won't point out who that person was. But I wasn't here in 1945. However, uh, in 1995, we produced this book, which is everything that anybody could ever want to know about the Manchester Pan-African Congress including all the proceedings of the Congress, everything which happened in Manchester in October 1945 is in this book. It also contains some biographies of some of the key organizers, some um, 
information about the main organizations and so on. So I recommend that you, those of you who are interested, uh, and it's important that we remember this history because there are many attempts to hide the history, to distort it, uh, to forget about it in various ways. And so we thought it was very important to record it. And I have to say that those who are mainly responsible for recording this history are or were the women of Manchester. It was they who took down in shorthand or in longhand the proceedings and put together the proceedings. So we should respect all those who participated in that endeavor 70 years ago. And when I say the women of Manchester, of course, I didn't just mean the African women of Manchester. Because many of those who attended and organized the Congress in 1945 uh, were not Africans. They were wives and friends of those who were those important people who we all speak of. So we remember their contribution too. What I'm going to do in the next few minutes is just try and present something of this history. I've got some pictures to show. Uh, we have some technical challenges. I don't know whether this very nice remote control will reach that far. So we'll see how we do. I just want to say one thing about the importance of the Manchester Congress. You probably know that before this Congress, there were four previous Congresses organized. Um, mainly organized by uh, African-American activist W.B. Du Bois. The Manchester Congress was entirely different in that it was organized here in Manchester and mainly by activists, pan-Africanists, who were located here in Britain or had some colonial connection with Britain. I'll explain a little bit more about them in a minute. The other thing I will say, and uh, something which is extremely important about this Congress, it was a Congress which united every Pan-African or African organization in Britain. The main organization which organized it, the Pan-African Federation, was a coalition of organizations from many towns and cities in Britain, including London, Manchester, Liverpool, Glasgow, Cardiff, so all the main organizations were united in organizing this event. And that's, uh, as I'm sure the organizers of this event will tell you, an amazing achievement. The other thing I should explain, which I mentioned last night, is that the politics of those who organized the Congress was a, what I would call a internationalist politics. They were not only concerned with the liberation of Africa and with Pan-Africanism, although they were devoted Pan-Africanists, they were also concerned with the liberation of everybody in the world. And I explained last night that they also organized two what they called subject people's conferences, which were held in London immediately before the Manchester Congress and involved activists and participants from India, from Sri Lanka, from Burma, and from many other countries. So they had a very definite politics, and that grew out of the circumstances in 1945. The fact that um, they had common experiences of being colonial subjects, and also the Congress was organized at the end of the Second World War in very special circumstances. So it was very much a Congress which summed up recent history, which learned from recent history, and then looked forward to how history was going to be transformed in the future. What would it take to actually end colonial rule, or to deal with problems of racism and so on and so forth? Okay, so I'm going to, uh, let's just, actually before we move on to the next slide, let me just give you an illustration of that. If you look on the far left, you'll see the placard that says Arabs and Jews unite against British imperialism. So this gives you an idea of their politics. On the 
Uh, on the wall behind Amy Ashford Garvey and Peter Milliard, you'll see another which says, Oppressed People of the World Unite. And on the far left, you'll see a slogan which is taken from the writings of Karl Marx, who I understand was a German gentleman. It says, I don't think you can read it, it says, Labour in the white skin cannot be emancipated while labour in the black skin is enslaved. So I'll say more about this in a moment, but this was the, anyway, the politics of 1945. Okay, if I can have the next slide, Mr. Slide Operator, please. Okay, so I wanted to just mention some of the main organisers. Some of them have been mentioned before. The first is George Padmore, who was one of the principal organisers of the Manchester Congress in 1945, born in Trinidad. He was, for many years, uh, one of the leading, we can say, African communists. By this time, he had a party company with the, the communist movement, and yet he retained many of the ideas which he gained as a, a communist organiser. And it was he and uh, it was, you could say, the, perhaps the principal organiser of this event, uh, certainly in political organiser of this event in Manchester in 1945. Okay, next slide, please. The second key figure is Kwame Nkrumah. And Nkrumah, in fact, had only come to Britain earlier in the year. Um, and this was one of the first major political events which Nkrumah organised. Of course, just a few years after this, he returned to what was then the Gold Coast to lead the struggle for independence. Uh, so he and Padmore were, as I say, two of the key organisers. And before this, Nkrumah had been a student activist in, in the US. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide. The third in kind of importance, I would say, is this gentleman here. This is somebody who perhaps is a little bit forgotten about today, a man called Isaac Wallace Johnson. Isaac Wallace Johnson came from Sierra Leone in West Africa. He was a major, we can say, organizer of workers, a labor organizer, a union organizer, trained in Moscow, as many activists were in the 1930s. His main, uh, his activities brought him uh, arrest and imprisonment. In fact, throughout the whole of the Second World War, he'd been interned by the, or imprisoned, you can say, by the British colonial authorities because of his anti-colonial and labor activism. And there's a kind of irony that at the end of the war, they not only had to release him from prison, but bring him all the way to London which I'll explain why in a moment. He was uh, also well known for his newspaper article, Has the African a God?, which he wrote in 1936 uh, during the period of the fascist invasion of Ethiopia, and which was a, anyway, a, a condemnation, we can say, of colonialism. And for that, writing that article, he was arrested and uh, charged with sedition. And anyway, it was a very famous case in the day. Okay, next. And the fourth one, another very important activist in Britain, Amy Ashford Garvey. As most of you probably know, the first wife of Marcus Garvey, uh, the joint founder of the UNIA, some would say, but certainly a major organiser in Britain from 1922 onwards, uh, a major activist during the 1930s and a key um, figure in 1945. And in fact, she chaired the opening of the first session and you saw her sitting on the uh, podium in the first picture I showed. Okay, next please. Then we have uh, Jomo Kenyatta, who'd also been a long-time activist in Britain from the 1920s. 
and who returned just after the Congress to Kenya, where, as you know, he played a key role in the liberation struggle in Kenya, was imprisoned uh, for his activities. In fact, while he was in Britain, he actually lived not very far away from where I teach, which is a rather strange place to live, in the middle of West Sussex. Um, but anyway, he'd been a, he was a major uh, figure in organising this event in Manchester. And here you see him actually pictured at the, at the Congress itself. Yeah, the next one, please. And this is, I had to steal this one from Getty. Uh, this is Peter Milliard. And Peter Milliard was a doctor here in Manchester, a physician. He was the president of the Pan-African Federation, which organized the event. Uh, another very important figure that people have largely forgotten about now. Um, I perhaps should explain that the Manchester Congress might never have happened. The original plan was that the Congress wouldn't be held here in Manchester. The original plan was it should be held in Paris, but they decided that the weather was better here in Manchester, <laughs> and so they switched it. It was originally going to be held in September, eventually it was held in October, and in fact they thought that it should be a small event, just a kind of precursor to a big Pan-African Congress which was going to be held in Africa. Well, Liberia was one of the places suggested, uh, but there were other possibilities as well. Uh, but that Congress was never held, and uh, so it was Manchester which took on that historic role. Okay, yeah, let's go next. Okay, now, I, I can't show all the figures. Uh, I haven't got a photo of, of Ras McConnan, and Ras McConnan was a very important uh, part of the organizing of the Congress here uh, because he uh, was involved in um, local businesses, restaurants and so on and assisted not only in organizing but actually looking after people who came to the Congress and so on. So he's very important but I didn't have a good photo of him so I didn't include him. But I just wanted to mention that some of the other activists who were here in 1945 and this is Eddie Duplan, who was actually from Liverpool, or I say, he was from what is today Ghana, but he operated in Liverpool. And later he went back to Ghana and worked alongside Mpruma, organising one of the other important Pan-African conferences, the All, Af All Africa People's Conference, which was held in 1958, the first major Pan-African con conference on the soil of Africa. Okay, and the next one, please. And the last one everybody knows, the famous son of Manchester. You know who this is? Len Johnson. Well, somebody does, that's good. This is the great Len Johnson. Great, great Len Johnson, who also attended this uh, event. If you don't know who Len Johnson is, then you should find out. I'm not going to tell you. Okay, let's go on. Sorry. And then the last uh, key organiser, or key participant, was W.B. Du Bois. And Du Bois had organised the previous four congresses uh, in 1919, 1921, 1923 and 1927. But he had no part in organising events here in Manchester in 1945. And in fact, Padmore and the others kept him away from the organisation. And he, in, in fact, he found out about it by accident and then was uh, honoured by being called the father of Pan-Africanism and presiding and so on. But those who were in Britain organised the Congress here in Britain. People in the US and elsewhere had nothing very much to do with it. Um, okay, let's move on because I'm conscious of time. Okay. I wanted to explain why the Congress was held in 1945 and why it was eventually held in Europe rather than in Africa and something of the politics of it. And this conference 
was held just a few months before, in fact, a few weeks before the Manchester Congress. And it was a conference of trade unions, of workers' organisations, held in London and in Paris. And for the first time, all the workers' organisations of the world were in one organisation. And to that conference were invited uh, union organisers, labour organisers from the colonies, from Africa, from the Caribbean. Um, and so George Padmore and the Pan-African Federation decided that this was an opportunity. Since these guys, and it was mainly men, were going to be here in Europe, that they should organise a Pan-African Congress. And they explained very carefully that they wanted to hold a congress of representatives of the masses of peoples in Africa and the Caribbean. They said we only want people who represent workers and farmers. We don't want professors and lawyers and these kind of people. We want the masses of people. And Padmore actually wrote to Du Bois explaining this that this was a new kind of Congress. He said that the working people in Africa and the Caribbean are on the move. They don't need doctors and lawyers and so on to tell them what to do anymore. So all the people who attended the Manchester Congress in 1945 were that. They were trade unionists, they were representatives of workers' organisations, farmers' organisations and so on. And so that gave it a very different flavour, a very different politics to previous congresses. Okay, next one please. And this gives you an example of what was going on in 1945 and why they were so concerned to have representatives of workers. This general strike took place in Nigeria just a few weeks before the congress. And it showed, it was one of the examples which showed the power of working people that those who work are the ones who create all the wealth. And also, if people stop working, countries come to a standstill. So they said, this is what we need to change the world. It's the working people of Africa and the Caribbean who are going to change things in our favor. We must organize amongst them. OK, next slide, please. So I wanted to present to you what they actually said. So there's no mistake, I'm not making it up. This is what was said. And one of the key and significant things about this Congress was that they said that if necessary, we will use force. The days of writing letters to the British government, sending delegations to Westminster, they're gone. We will use force if necessary to liberate ourselves. And this was a very important development in the history of Pan-Africanism, that this was established. Okay, next one please, you can read it for yourself. So. Okay, well you can see here at the bottom, this, what I said, this idea of internationalism. That they were in unity with people who were struggling against oppression throughout the world, as well as being pan african Okay, next one, please. Thirdly, here you can see that they identified who they thought the enemy was. And in particular, they used the word, which perhaps people are a bit frightened of using today, they used the word imperialism. That they said this was the problem that they had to overcome and remove. Next one, please. You see, as I mentioned last night, they also clearly condemn what they called the monopoly of capital, by which they meant capitalism. They didn't say the way we're going to liberate ourselves is by becoming rich. They said the way we're going to liberate ourselves is by removing this system which oppresses us in the colonies, in Britain, in the US, wherever we are. And that, they said, was this system which squeezes the lifeblood out of everybody, which you're familiar with, because you live in. Okay, next one, please. 
Okay, I wanted to just illustrate this point about the importance of workers because uh, Chief Kolka, who was also a Congress, was a representative of the Nigerian Trade Union Congress and one of just several uh, workers, delegates who attended. Okay, next one please. I wanted to emphasize again what I said last night, that the uh, resolutions which they passed, the demands which they raised, one was that they condemned the imposition of colonial borders in Africa. They said, we don't recognize these colonial borders. They've been imposed on us. So they were pan-Africanists in that sense too. And as you can see here, they talked about the rights of people to empower themselves. And of course they rejected also the political institutions, the political system of Eurocentrism. The political system which we know exists in this country, but also exists in Africa, the Caribbean, the US. So they rejected that. Okay, next one please. Here you can say, see two very important statements. Uh, the bottom one is, again, they emphasize that it was the masses of people, those who create all the wealth, that were also going to be the force which was going to end colonial rule. And they were the force that needed to be organized. And then the intellectuals, the professors, and lawyers, and social workers, and others, to join with the workers. That's how things were going to be changed. And of course, those who were most far-sighted of them then implemented this idea, particularly somebody like Kwame Nkrumah, who organized amongst workers, women, and so on and so forth. And they identified the kind of weapons they could use. Again, based on their experience, strikes, Boycotts, like the boycotts that took place in West Africa in the 1930s, the rebellions of workers in the Caribbean in the 1930s. They looked at their history, they drew the lessons from it, from their own experience, and then looked forward to how they could change things in the future. Okay, next one please. Well, you can see, you can read these things for yourself, and you can see the politics for yourself. I don't need to read it out. But the emphasis was on the masses of the people. Of course, if we look at Africa and the Caribbean today, we can see that these, uh, this politics of 1945 was implemented to some extent, but not to the fullness. And so we still have all the problems that we can discuss in detail because the economic system, the political system, political institutions are, have not yet been removed. And we still have the same political systems in Africa and the Caribbean as we have in Britain, the US and so on. Okay, next one please. So this was the nature of the 1945 Pan-African Congress. I'm conscious of the time that I have, so I'm not going to show you um, more slides. But it's this politics of 1945, as well as those who participated in it, uh, which gave 1945 such an important place in history, which people still look at today. Just a couple of years ago, there was a big celebration for the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Organization of African Unity, uh, held internationally, and everybody talked about Manchester in 1945. That it created the, it opened the way to the liberation of Africa in particular. But we should say, open the way. It didn't secure that liberation. That liberation is still to be obtained. But as we know, we are our own liberators. So it's our responsibility to carry on that struggle that was begun in Manchester 
or was articulated in this particular way in Manchester in 1945. Okay, thank you for your attention and time. Now, the other big point to make 
is that too many Garveyites believe that Marcus Garvey was a rabid anti-Marxist and that they too must be. And it's very important that we understand, as we say in Jamaica, that not in Augusta. <laughs> Garvey had to fight communists who tried to saw the scope of his organization, tried to enter and take it over. Some of them who went in didn't try to take it over, but made a contribution from within. But for it's in the nature of Marxism that they feel that the class position is fundamentally superior to all others. And Marcus Garvey was thought to be um, the ultimate misleading bourgeois organizer of black folk. And so it was the class duty of serious Marxists to organize against him for the soul of the people. Right? So Garvey had to fight some Marxists. It's important that that same man, who was no racist, recognized what was happening in the white world and acknowledged it. He recognized, for example, the importance of the Irish uprising in 1916. And there's nothing odd about that because at the start of Garvey's political life, he was in a movement in Jamaica that was very influenced by Irish development. Also, Marcus Garvey, when the Bolshevik Revolution happened, recognized that an important development had taken place in world affairs and that working people would benefit from that process which had to be completed. And you can find Garvey saying these things. We don't understand how much Garvey documents there are. We don't understand the massive truth. Um, we don't know what Tony Martin did around Garvey. We don't know what Professor Robert Hill has done about Garvey. There are at least 12, certainly 11, volumes of this kind that contain material on and by and about Garvey, um, edited and put together by Professor Robert Hill, who is a Jamaican scholar working in the United States of America. So some words about Garvey and how he connects to um, 20th and 21st century revolutionary pan -Africanism. We all know, should know, that Garvey was born in Jamaica in 1887. He had a very interesting childhood, had a father who had a library, unusual for, for poor Jamaicans, um, and that father didn't say, boy, I read the book then, and said, boy, I read the book then. <laughs> so Garvey um, obtained an important kind of education, an exceptional education. He also had a godfather who, when his father ran out of the capacity to continue his education, Garvey was taken in by his grandfather, who was a, a printer, and uh, Garvey was master of one of the key technologies of the modern era, of the, the um, post-Renaissance era, printing. The book, the printed book before the computer was where it was at knowledge-wise, and Garvey had complete control of that technology. Now, Garvey spent the years up to 1914 doing something that he describes in this book as going here, there, and everywhere, and trying to understand the condition that black people face. In 1914, he said, having done that, and he really had, including two years here, having done that, he said, I find that African people are in a situation of degradation, that was his word, caused by white injustice and by the fail our own failure, including the failure of what he called positioned and educated black people, Negroes, his word, right? And he asked the kind of question that Lenin asked. First, what is the actual objective situation? And secondly, what is to be done about it? In 1914, Marcus Garvey was ready to do something revolutionary about it, and in fact proceeded to do so. 
Now, um, a friend of mine, today or last night, said to me that you lot are trying to put into Garvey stuff that's not there. And I said to him very gently, what, is, what studies have you done on Garvey such as to enable you to say to me that what I'm saying is in Garvey isn't there? And um, he's a good friend and a sensible man, so he shut up. <laughs> shut up at that point. But it's important that there is enough material on Garvey that is very poorly understood, the implications of which are just barely grasped. So, 1914, the founding of the UNIA, it matters. The program, what is to be done, Garvey said that we had to do stuff, revolutionary stuff, in relation to our consciousness and our self-organization, out of self-love. And he's talking about the people who suffered from a bad case of lack of self-love. So the reconstruction process, the revolutionary reconstruction process, involved a focus on African self-love. Love of the people of the race that freed, is what he talked about. He proposed a set of economic um, activity, uh, cooperative um, economics amongst the people. I do not say that that was in itself revolutionary, but it does matter that Africans in self-love recognize that we have remarkable capacities to self-mobilize and self-organize on the basis of the resources that we have amongst ourselves if we pool them. I'm not saying that it's a route to liberation. I'm saying it's absolutely important to do it and to start to recognize that, and it was a revolutionary thing to be proposing in 1914. From the point of view of Pan-Africanism, my brothers and sisters and comrades, it matters that Garvey was saying in 1914, unlike what everybody else was saying, that not that we must go to London and negotiate with these people, or to Paris, or to Portugal, or wherever, and negotiate with these people. But Garvey was saying that Africa must be liberated from colonialism and united. That was a program on the basis of which, in 1914, Marcus Garvey started the UNIA. That Africa must be liberated and united. At the end of the second of the First World War, and it matters that the end of the First World War, in certain respects, was quite like the end of the Second World War, right? There had been a lot of movements. Africans were up in arms in Africa. There had been revolts on continental Africa during that war. There were revolts by Caribbean soldiers um, in the aftermath of the war. One of those took place in, 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 in Italy. It mattered that Africans in the United States of America were on the physical move away from the South to the cities of the North, and that that represented the basis of, of, of social and socioeconomic transformation, and so on. That moment, and it also matters, that the world was full of deceptive talk about equity, about world governance, about all kinds of stuff like that. It matters that the forces that ran the world met to organize the League of Nations. It matters that Garvey sent delegates to, to that, into that process. And it matters that what Garvey was saying in that moment, that Africa are supposed to be the people in charge of Africa. That those colonies that used to belong to Italy and Germany should not be given to the others through some bogus mandate process, but needed to be given to Africa. It matters that a little bit later on, Garvey organized a serious, seriously funded project um, called the Liberia Project which was about establishing a bridgehead for returning Africans into the continent of Africa as the spearhead of a process for the unification and liberation of the continent. Now, all of that matters. And it matters that Marcus Garvey was, in fact, not one of the graduates that my brother, Professor Hakim.
Hakim was talking about who were around prior to 1945. But from a major revolutionary, anti-colonialist, right from 1914, you can go and look at the pages of his popular newspaper, the Black, um, the Negro World. Go and look at it. You will see cartoons of little ragamuffin um, saying to the whites as they ascend the gangplanks of ships, why don't the African and put them on them to come on? Right? Um, some of the stuff is actually in Creole, in, 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 in um, the, the language of, 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 of the people. And it matters that this stuff was not being just said in an intellectual mode, but was being said as part of popular mobilization towards the total liberation and unification of Africa. It matters that, for me, one of the essences of 1945 isn't just that there were communist-trained African forces in the leadership of it, it also matters that in that moment, what had happened was that the Pan-African movement had caught up with Garvey's radicalism, revolutionary Pan-Africanism, right. in relation to the liberation and unification of Africa. That is one of the key significances of the 1945 Pan-African um, Congress, and we need to begin to understand and acknowledge that. Now, it matters that one of the key figures, undoubtedly, in that conference was none other than Kwame Nkrumah. It matters that Kwame Nkrumah said in the clearest terms that I have been influenced from two reading and mobilizing sources. One, Marx and Engels, and the other, Marcus Garvey's philosophy and opinion. It matters that when Kwame Nkrumah went back to Africa to lead that process, that that is one of the fundaments of his foundation, of his progress, of his organization. Africa must unite, Africa must be free. And that was the Garveyite position. It matters that what came out of that was exactly what uh, Professor Hakim Adi says, which is that the process led to the foundation of 50-odd African states. It matters, importantly, that almost without exception, probably without exception, what we now have is 50-odd It matters that the uniting agency, first the Organization of African Unity, and then the AU, are powerful expressions of neocolonialism. It matters that when Kwame Nkrumah fought for a structure to unite Africa, the OAU that emerged was not what he wanted or fought for. The OAU that emerged was precisely the one that the West, using its agents in Africa, managed to achieve or wanted to achieve. And it matters that his imperial majesty kind of went down the middle and helped to establish and gets credit for having helped to establish the OAU in uh, 1963. But the fact that his majesty was fundamental to, that, um, uh, to, to, to the establishment of that is no reason not to understand what it really was, which is that was a manifestation of what the West really required if Africa was going to be united in a structure that had better be there, and they got their agents to set it up in, a, in ways that suit them. And the subsequent reorganization into the African Union has not particularly improved matters. So, even though the process that Garvey informed, along with Marxist trained blacks in 19, Africans in 1945, led to an, an anti-colonial revolution, 
that, that has manifest as a system of neocolonial states, and those neocolonial states now do not in any way represent the masses that were in garbage organizations or the smaller numbers of people who were in the communist organization. That matters. It matters that those structures, those states, those nation states, those 50 odd nation states, are agencies of murder and exploitation on behalf of imperialism, white power. That's what they are. If you live in Jamaica, you don't have to live in Jamaica, you know, as a matter of fact, that that government kills, through its police forces, 200 plus people per year, shoots them down, the police in Jamaica. It matters that that same police force, thank you, my sister, it matters that that same police force with the army in 2010 killed, on their figure, cold-bloodedly, 73 people at a place called Tripoli, that on the former leader of the opposition's figures, uh, Mr. Mr. Edward Siaga, they killed that state on that occasion, 150 people in cold blood, and that on the people's account, the number is in, in the region of 250 persons. That they burned and buried bodies. I was there, not that I saw any of it. I was in Jamaica at the time. I saw on the, on, on the television an army officer being interviewed by a you know, enthusiastic journalist. He said, is it true that you people buried and burned bodies? And the man said, I am neither confirming nor denying that. <laughs> but if we did it, there was a state of emergency on, and we were entitled to do anything, repeat anything. It's not true, you know. State of emergency does not cover war crimes, which is what they committed on that occasion. State of emergency doesn't give you carte blanche to commit crimes against humanity, right? And the same thing is happening sometimes less dramatically all over the world, in all over the African world. In 2012, was it? Yes. South Africa, the place called Marikana. Right? A hundred plus people shot down, 30 or dead. Right? Sura Ramaphosa, who used to be one of the finest mass organizers that I've ever seen. I thought, wow, that man needs to be the next president of, 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 the, of South Africa. And was disappointed when he, when he didn't succeed Nelson. But Cyril was sitting at the center of that deliberate murder of African people for no reason. They, they weren't even moving in a revolutionary way. They were simply demanding a little bit extra um, wages. So, um, even if what I argue is true, and it is, that Marcus Garvey has to be factored back into 20th century Pan-Africanism, that we cannot continue with the foolishness of talking about eight Pan-African Congresses which ignore the eight that Garvey organized, most of which were bigger than all of the Congresses that other people organized. We must stop that foolishness, right? And in addition to that, we then got to take the an analysis forward. What has happened since 1945? And I've been through that to some extent already. What has happened is that because the revolution against colonialism, it left imperialism and capitalism, which, which some of the people, the Marxist ones of them, recognized were the real enemy, and that that revolution had not taken place. That's the difference between Africa and China or Africa and Cuba. The Cuban revolution and the Chinese revolution broke with Western imperialism, gave those people space to do real stuff for real people, rather than pretending and, 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 and um, substituting idiocies around reparations for revolutionary struggle, yeah? So, we need to understand where we are. We need an analysis in 2015 of the type that Marcus Garvey did in 1914. What is the condition that us African people face? And the answer is very simple, you know. We face imperialism primarily as neocolonialism. And then the what is to be done defeat it or die, because Africans are fundamentally, and this is not an exaggeration, right? it's not even poetic, it's just true. We face really menacing, ruthless, deadly enemy. 
And you can see them in operation, right? They call it regime change. Look at what they did in Libya. Libya. No care. Look at what they did in, um, you don't matter where you mention, Ivory Coast, right? Look at what they're doing in, right? Not, not a black country, no. In, in Syria. What are they doing there? They are the ones who caused the civil war. They told the opposition, do not compromise because we are going to make you win. And what they want is the overthrow of a man who was never in their pocket, even though he's himself no revolutionary. And last week or week before, I heard on radio um, one of them saying what the real objective in Syria is, and the first time I, I, I've heard it expressed by David Owen. He said that Syria is going to end up divided into perhaps four or five blocks. Um, one would be this, one would be that, one would be the next thing, post Assad. Now, you hear them talking about Assad barrel bombing and killing his own people. That's in the process of a civil war which they started. The West, be in no doubt, has no morality round the matter. Yes, thank you. The, the, the West, in these matters, has no morality round mass murder, right? In Indonesia, 500,000 communists killed by one of their, their, um, their, their dictators, army man, later um, civilian dictator, so forth, right? In Egypt, recently, an elected government overthrown by the army, the army proceeds to kill at least 3,000 people in the street. And Tony Blair comes on and says, we must support the Egyptian government, right? These people are deadly. They don't care about our lives. They don't care about our assets other than to make sure that we find processes to bring those assets into their hands, and everything about neocolonialism and what our neocolonial leaders have signed up to is precisely about putting those resources that belong to us into their hands. You can go and examine what our idiotic leadership has signed up to since the time of Reagan and Thatcher, since that um, neoliberal moment. And you will see that the West no longer even has to invade because our leaders have signed them the right to do this and that and the next thing. And they're taking more out of Africa now than they have ever done, even under enslavement. Yeah? We Africans have to wake up to this, right? Our movement has taken us to a point. We have to do the analysis. We face something worse than degradation, which Darwin was talking about in 1914, and carrying out the African revolution for real liberation, for unification, and beyond that, reparations from them for what they've done to us. Yeah. That's the objective. Thank you.
and then what we'll do is once the lunch is over after that session, then we'll break for lunch much later. So when we have this short break after the next speaker, then you know please pick up some refreshments if you need to to keep you going. Um, I'd like to introduce now Sir Jeff Palmer and um, Professor Palmer has worked in research on cereal grains. Professor Sir Jeff Palmer, lots of things to remember to introduce you. Get it right. Um, Professor Sir Jeff Palmer OBE uh, has worked in research on cereal grains for nearly 50 years. He's worked in world, worldwide travel and he's lectured in the Harriet Watt University for nearly 30 years. He holds five honorary degrees. He was awarded the OBE on honorary doctorate for scientific and charitable work. He was the fourth person to be awarded the Distinguished American Award for his research on cereals. And he was awarded a knighthood in the New Year's Honours List in 2014 for his work in science, human rights, and charity. Thank you very much. Welcome. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, first before I begin, I, I, I don't live in Manchester, I live in Edinburgh. <laughs> so I came down yesterday um, to your meeting because I think it's very important and I'm off this afternoon to Birmingham where I'll be joining the Jamaicans tonight <laughs> at the Jamaican Association dinner which I come down to every October <laughs> over the last 20 years and then I go back to Edinburgh on Sunday. Um, it, it's a pleasure being here and listening to the previous speakers. Um, I'm a sort of an immigrant. I came to this country in 1955, and I was five when your, the 1945 Pan-African Conference, so you know exactly how old I am. <laughs> you can work it out. I'm 75. <laughs> Um, I, when I heard your libations this morning, and I heard the word Pokamania because I went to a Pokamania church in Jamaica when I was a boy. So that, I'm part of your active history. Um, I'm also, it's important that we were talking about um, 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 African history. It's important that we realize that as far as the Caribbean is concerned, and I know Jamaica rather well in that regard, and I think everybody here, whether they're Africans or Jamaicans, should know what this year is. 150 years after what? It's 150 years after the Morak Bay Rebellion. And the Morak Bay Rebellion, as you know, it was Bogle and Gordon they both challenged the system. And in those days when you challenged the system, you were hanged. Both of them were hanged on the 23rd and 24th of October. This is the month, 150 years ago. That rebellion changed the whole attitude of British government to managing black country because, in fact, they realized they had a responsibility, and that responsibility, if it wasn't, in fact, attended to in terms of the people they were governing, there would be trouble. And this is what Bogle and Gordon, in fact, showed in 1865. Now, as far as today is concerned, I don't know how much time I've got, probably not very much, so I don't want to take too long. Um, as far as my position is concerned, what I would say, whatever I've achieved, because people have always asked me that, how did you get to where you are having arrived in a banana boat in 1955? I travelled from Jamaica to, to Liverpool on my own. I was 14 years and 11 months. And people have asked me, and I, today is not to talk about that, I'm supposed to talk about science. I would say that my achievement is due to a group of women 
are my, my mother's sisters and my mother. In fact, my mother left Jamaica in 1948 to come to London, and she, it took her from 1948 to 1955 to save 86 pounds. And she used that 86 pounds to bring me here. That's what it cost her to pay my fares to come to London from Almond Town in Jamaica. Now, if there are any Jamaicans here who know Almond Town, they will tell you they don't know, know anybody over 40 years of age who come from Almond Town. It's a very difficult part of Kingston. But it was also Marcus Garvey's constituent as a councillor. So, if you know your history, Marcus Garvey is about the area in Jamaica that I come from. So, what does it take to produce a son like myself? It took 86 pounds, because without that, I wouldn't have been able to come here. So, when people say they need more than 86 pounds to change their lives, then, in fact, it, it, isn't, it isn't necessarily true. Because when my mother, she left school at 11 in Jamaica. So when she came here in 48, the only book she could read or have read was the Bible. When I came in 1955, I passed no exams in Jamaica. I went to church. I went to North Street Congregational Church. So again, that's the only education I had when I arrived in London in 1955. And I lived with her and my brother in one room in Haringey. And just about talking about Haringey is to interlink. When I eventually got to university, and I'm not here to talk about that, but when I eventually got to university, and I got to Edinburgh to do a PhD many, many years later in 1965, I was talking to a young man who was very depressed and very worried. He had he, he was having difficulty with his studies and he wanted to leave Edinburgh. And I had 10 pounds in my pocket in 1965. And I said to him, I'm going to give you five pounds. And I said to him, if I were you, I would go to London. I said, I know Haringey well because that's where we, I come from. I suggested he should go to Haringey. And he did, he took the five pounds and he took the bus and he came to London. Do you know who that person was? Bernie Grant. <laughs> so this is the guy who gave him five pounds and I used to see him quite regularly after that and I said, Bernie, I want my five pounds back. <laughs> <laughs> I never got it. <laughs> and even my mother, when she and I used to have an argument, uh, she died in 2003. She used to tell her friends in Haringey, she said, they said, Miss Ivy, where's your son? And she said, my son, she said, I don't know, he's still at school. I was the head of the brewing department in Edinburgh as the professor there. So that's not great, in fact, history, but it is what I call contemporary history in terms of how we live and how you've got to look after your children because they are the people that are going to make the contribution. My mother has made her contribution through me, and what I will do is to just say a word or two about that in terms of the scientific work I do. Now, I came, and quite quickly, I was terribly good at cricket, and I was transferred to a grammar school in London, and eventually I got a job at London University, and I was a technician, and the professor there encouraged me to go to night school. No British university would take me in 1961, but he got me to Leicester University, and I got a first degree. I got a PhD in 67, and I did research for the brewing industry, and I went back as a lecturer at the university in 1977, and I became a professor in 89, and as my mother would say, the rest is history. The point is that it can be done. And I'm saying if a, 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 a woman who can bring me here, and all she, her job was a finisher, dress finisher, and she is the person who in fact made a difference in my life. Not some great politics 
or some great uh, philosophy. It's just that she was always there when I came home in London in that time. Now, what have I done in terms of science? Because, as I said, I don't have time to go through that. I eventually, when I got my PhD in Edinburgh in 68, I left Edinburgh and I got a job at the Brewing <coughs> Research Foundation in Surrey. It's not far from Redhill. There wasn't any black people in sight in those days, and no black scientists worked for the brewing industry worldwide, from California to Japan. I was the only one. And I worked for the British brewing industry in Surrey. By 1970, and you can look it up, I developed a process called barley abrasion. So if you type in barley abrasion on your computer, you'll see it. It's called abrasion, A-B-R-A-S-I-O-A. -A. Now, I developed that process in 69, and by 1972, 60% of the beers made in the UK was made with it. I was on the BBC Live Scientific program on the 4th of August. You can look that up as well. On the 4th of August, the BBC interviewed and instead of the, 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 the I'm, I'm fairly well known international, and I have had to defend myself in the life, in, in the Spectator, in the Spectator newspaper. If you look, type in my name and look at Spectator, you will see the argument that some guy who wrote Mrs. Thatcher's biography decided to question a comment I made that when I was interviewed for an MSc and I didn't get it. I was interviewed by Sir Keith Joseph, and he turned me down and told me to go back to Jamaica and grow bananas. <laughs> you know, he said, go back to where you come from and grow bananas. And I told him it was very difficult to grow bananas in Harringay. <laughs> However, the point is that this is the person, I developed the abrasion process in 69, the British brewers, it was being used to produce so 60% of beers in the UK was being made with it. In 1985, when the Nigerian government banned the import of European grain because it was costing Nigeria more money to import European grain to make beer, and the big brewers in Nigeria were Guinness and Heineken. And the story, and this is a fact, I had a telephone call from London and I was told to come to London because the Guinness company wanted to speak to me. And I came to London in 1985, I sat with the director, and he said, Jeff, we've got a problem in Nigeria. You know, we've got four breweries there. Guinness was making more money in Nigeria than they were making in London. And I had lunch, and the guy said, the director said, Jeff, you've really got to go to Nigeria. We're, we, we've got a problem, we can't close our breweries. You are the guy who knows most about cereals. So my expertise is cereals. Barley, wheat, malt, sorghum, Afri the African grain. So I sat in London and I said to him, well, look, John, as you know, I was born in Jamaica and I left Nigeria under difficult circumstances 200 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and I've forgotten the language. <laughs> And he said, and this is absolutely true, he said, Jeff, you're the only person in the world that Nigerians believe. <laughs> because by that time, I taught Nigerian brewers. So the, the Nigerian brewers today in Guinness and NBL Heineken breweries are my students. The Red Stripe you drink are made by my students. The Fuller's beer you drink are made by my students. And the craft brewers around the world who bears you see, a majority of them are my students. <laughs> In fact, when I got the knighthood last year, I got 12 bottles of beer from London. And it was my student who worked for Fuller's Brewery who got all the young brewers in London they each put together their own beers and posted it to me in Edinburgh. And if you look on the internet, you can't say, the spectator said something about me and all my students are, I've 
are against them. So what we, you have is, I had to go to Nigeria in 1985. Now what I had to do for the company, as Guinness and Heineken, is to see whether we could make beer from the local grain, so. And I went, and I, uh, we, we had a look round, and I was sent to Meduguri, which is where the little difficulties at the moment. I went to Meduguri on my own, we looked around, and I came to the conclusion with a lot of other guys, we can make the beer from the local grain. That's Guinness. Eventually we did that. And when I went back to Nigeria, one of the greatest regard of my students in Nigeria for me is that they refer to their local grain as LRM, local raw material, was being used to make European beer. That to me is the kind of what we can do for Africa, as, as Africans, we're all the diaspora, as I see it. So we work to help each other. And if you look at that flag over there, we don't have to give a great, um, uh, to prove Garvey's influence in Africa. That black star is Garvey's black star line. <laughs> when I go, went to South Africa, to talk to the South African brewers or to talk to the, Niger to the Zimbabwean brewers. The fact is that I was Jamaican, they in fact were so proud because I had the skills which, when I went to Kenya, the, 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 the Kenya brewers used to say that these are the black brewers. They say when the German brewers used to talk to us, they just told us to pull that lever. He says, what you've done for us, you've told us why that lever should be pulled. Not just to pull it. So what we need is to go from a situation where, in fact, we are the, you know, the, the, the hewers of the wood and the fetchers of the water in order to be, we are the people who are, are in the machine so we can change the direction of where things are going. And, yeah, just uh, <laughs> 10 minutes. Okay, I've got 10 minutes. And, I, and that was the Nigeria situation. We eventually, when I'm in Edinburgh, I've got a Nigerian uh, ex-student of mine, and he wouldn't leave. <laughs> He's called Dr. Reginald Agu. And if you type in a Reginald Agu, you'll find him on the, the internet. He rings me every day to check how well I am. <laughs> and he's been doing that for 20 years. <laughs> He, in fact, has carried on the work, and he's now working for the Scotch whisky industry in Edinburgh. And, in fact, I keep in touch with a lot of my students, whether they're in California, whether they're in Japan or China. This was done by my mother, who spent 86 pounds. So she is the person lying in her grave just outside Kingston. The point is that it is as parents, as uncles or cousins, what I'm saying is that you give a black child a chance because you don't, we don't know the potential of anybody. And the fact is that without my mother doing that, I wouldn't have done what I've done. If you hear about the scanning electron microscope, I am the first person in the world to have used that microscope to show the structure of cereals. So we know now what wheat grains inside looks like. We know what barley grains inside looks like. And if you type my name in on the computer, and you type, whether it's abrasion, if you type my name on barley, it's all you have to do. And you will get up a whole load of stuff. Um, I don't know who puts that stuff on there, <laughs> because I can just about work my phone. But. Anything to do with barley research or cereals research, I'm still writing about, even though I retired in 2005 and I'm 76 next year. The point is that if my mother hadn't done that, I could probably still be in Jamaica. The point is that I was brought up with my brother in the same house. He died two years ago because, unfortunately, he was born in London with me and we are from Haringey, so he 
got the bitter end of the stick, I was lucky in order to, 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 to get out. So I come from a, a family or a situation where I had to leave, not doing an exam at Leicester University to defend my brother in the Bow Street court because he was there for drugs. I was arrested for stealing a car in 1956 when I couldn't drive. <laughs> So you're not absolved from that kind of thing. And if you read The Spectator of last week, is where the writer, and I challenged him, and I don't, because I'm capable of doing that. He, in fact, was trying to say the Keith Joseph story wasn't true. But if you read what he's written, and I'm not saying that, I'm not making it up, his first article was trying to imply that if I wasn't telling the truth about Sir Keith Joseph, Sir Keith Joseph wasn't a pedophile. That's the obscene aspect of the way we have to live. And even in my position, I am not above that, so it shows what you've got to work against. And therefore, don't be, in fact, and Whittacombe, and Whittacombe of all people wrote a piece in my defense. And she said, you're talking to an honest man, a man who's capable of admit when he didn't know, but also a man that has contributed a lot to the society. So, finally, I'm no great philosopher or great historian or whatever, but what I'm very grateful for is that everybody who has helped me throughout my life and the fact is that you're not bright enough to defeat this system. You need every help you can get. And what I will do finally, because my time is done, for the two youngest people in the audience, that's a copy of my book, you can't buy it. <laughs> it can't be bought because in fact I print it myself. It has been used by schools. The two youngest people, would you come up? <laughs> I'll write your names in it, I've already signed it.